Welcome to Chain Reaction, the Foreign Policy Research Institute's flagship network of podcast series examining the political, security, economic, and social trends shaping Europe and Eurasia. Throughout the year, we're talking with experts about developments in Russia's war in Ukraine, the new European security order, the past, present, and future of the Baltic states, Russia's political economy, and great power competition in the region. Join us each month for Bear Market Brief, Baltic Ways, Report, in short, The Continent, and of course, our flagship, Chain Reaction. New episodes are available each week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. This week on the Bear Market Brief. Here on the brief, we've got two rules. One, don't talk about the brief. I'm kidding. Please do actually tell a friend about this podcast. Now, rule one is that Russia and the countries that we talk about in this podcast are real places, real societies that are subject to the laws of political gravity, just like any other country. Rule two is that wherever possible, we avoid Kremlinology, baseless speculation about what's happening in the inner halls of the Kremlin. Simply put, we do not know what's happening inside Vladimir Putin's head. So that being the case, how do we understand the conduct of leaders? What drives them? And why do they make mistakes? I'm Aaron Schwartzbaum. You're listening to The Bear Market Brief, and we've got another theory episode for you today, folks. But I promise, this is a fascinating one. I'll be investigating why leaders, autocrats in particular, make foreign policy mistakes. What leads them astray? And how do we apply some of this theory to what we're seeing in Ukraine? Joining us is Seva Gunitsky. Seva is an associate professor of political science at the University of Toronto. His work examines how international forces like war and globalization shape democracy and domestic reforms. He is the author of Aftershocks, Great Powers and Domestic Reforms in the 20th Century. In addition to numerous academic journals, he publishes frequently in outlets like Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, New Republic, and others. So let's dive in. Hope you enjoy. Seva, welcome to the Bear Market Brief. Great to have you with us. Well, Aaron, thanks for having me. All right, let's jump straight in. Um, First, just by way of introduction, tell us a little bit about yourself and what's keeping you busy these days. (laughs) Uh, Well, what's keeping me busy doesn't always involve my work, but when it does come to that, uh, I'm interested in democratization, uh, namely from a global perspective. And I'm really interested in how things like outside forces, like wars, imperial collapses, even technology, uh, can shape the evolution of domestic regimes, democratic regimes in particular. And I'm also very interested lately in uh, late Soviet history and Russian foreign policy, uh, working on the book right now, uh, dealing with the coup against Gorbachev in 1991. And uh, basically my job is I've been a professor of political science, uh, associate professor of political science at the University of Toronto for 12 years now. Uh, and here I am. Well, great to have you. Uh, lots of interesting directions we could talk about from what you uh could mention or had mentions there. Let's jump to question number one here. Um, A couple of weeks before uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you published an article in Foreign Affairs about autocrats, information bubbles, and how leaders, autocrats in particular, make mistakes and misjudge. Can you tell us about that piece, what you were exploring in it? If you recall at that time, a lot of people were predicting that if an invasion did happen, it would be a quick one in which Russia would simply overwhelm Ukraine with pretty much little resistance, maybe no resistance, and take Kiev in a few days. And we know that was the feeling inside the Kremlin as well. And they were wrong, of course, but that was also the predictions coming out of the West, uh, like the White House and General Milley uh, and those people. And so our goal in that piece uh, with my co-author, Adam Casey, who was great, uh, was to push back on that a bit and say, this is actually a terrible idea for Russia. It's not going to go well. Uh, and here's why. And basically, the reason we argued for why it's a bad idea is that leaders in personalist regimes like Russia are prone to making mistakes based on having poor information. Now, what do I mean by personalist regime? That's essentially an autocratic system where power is not distributed among a, a party or a military elite but is basically concentrated in the hands of a, an individual. 
and this is not unique to Russia, of course. We see similar things in China and Turkey and Venezuela. But what's really important about these regimes is that they're very opaque and they are very informal. Informal in the sense that they don't function through formal institutions like courts or bureaucracies, uh, but through informal connections and networks, especially personal loyalties. And of Putin, of course, is the sort of the quintessential example of this. And he shuns official channels and sort of prefers small informal gatherings. And so this makes understanding his policy making very challenging, even when you compare it to other personal regimes. So you know, all we can really try to do is read the tea leaves, like back in the Kremlinology days, for the most part. But there is a catch, which is that personalist regimes like Putin's do have distinct characteristics. Uh, so some of these are, for example, personalist leaders face fewer checks on power. They are less accountable for failed foreign policy. And very importantly, they surround themselves with loyal but incompetent advisors. And this often creates these echo chambers where only the information that aligns with the leader's beliefs is presented to him. It's not just that these regimes have problems with information. It's a universal challenge in government. Of course, democracies have these problems too. But what's unique about personal regimes is how these informational challenges are amplified. It's the very nature of these regimes makes discovering quality information difficult. And there's a few reasons for that. First of all, autocracies are already predisposed to information problems. Autocrats live in the dark. That's kind of their historical disadvantage. If I might, why are democracies better with kind of this information problem? Uh, there's a few reasons. One is that there are checks and balances. There are veto points. So, so if somebody has a really bad idea, at least in theory, there will be somebody there to stop or ameliorate the, the consequences. Secondly, there's public debate on the merits of various policies within the elite and across society more general. None of that exists in autocracies. Their institutions are opaque. Their public deliberation is limited or non-existent. Public opinion polls are deeply unreliable. So if you want to find out your people's grievances, that's really hard. Personalist regimes, the problem is even worse than that. Because if you're a person, personalist ruler, it's not just about suppressing dissent in the wider public sphere. They also have to encourage loyalty over competence within their own elite. They have to divide and fragment their security agencies on purpose to keep them kind of weak so that if they get too powerful, they might try to overthrow the ruler. So this kind of dynamic helps them stay in power, but it also creates a very screwed up understanding of reality. There are these pathologies to personalist regimes that uh, democratic regimes or even quote unquote normal autocratic regimes may not have as much. Uh, and again, think about why. Consider why personalist regimes or personalist leaders find themselves encircled by these sycophants, by yes men. For them, the stakes of losing power are extremely dire. Imprisonment, exile, death, sure. So as a result, you need loyal people. You need people who are perhaps more loyal and competent. And in fact, again, if they are too competent, they may try to overthrow you. And uh, the result is you get a sort of a palace court of loyalists and flatterers and extremists. This environment sort of creates a, a kind of group think where you know, once policy is set on a particular trajectory, alternative perspectives completely disappear. Healthy debate completely disappears. And this becomes more pronounced as rulers entrench themselves in power over time. Putin has been in power for over two decades. Uh, we know from looking at regimes like this that as rulers stay in power, confidence in their own judgment grows. They become over-optimistic. Uh, the circle tightens. And again, Putin is a classic example of this. From what we hear from people who uh, study uh, Putin or uh, interviewed people who are close to Putin, he became a lot more confident in his abilities after 2012, after returning to the leadership. So you can see all of these things over time in Russia, the consolidation of the inner sanctum. Now it's basically hardline loyalists, all the Siloviki, the security services. It's the FSB that's you know, at the table, not the MFA, right? And that's not just a personnel change. That's a symptom of a fundamental transformation in the way information flows and in the way decisions are made in Russia. In a more sort of institutionalized autocracy where you have some semblance of institutions, there would be enough separate groups or separate agencies that are powerful enough to tell leaders when their aggression is backfiring or when they need to moderate their claims. But the Russian government really lacks any kinds of those checks or balances. Uh, it even lacks even a way to collect the data that it needs to prosecute the war. 
It doesn't have a system to create collective judgments uh, from its multiple intelligence services, the way the intelligence estimates are done in the US. To kind of zoom in here, not to put you on the spot, do any examples come to mind if we're looking at Putin specifically, how the decision to go to war in Ukraine or to reinvade Ukraine more accurately came together? Does anything jump out at you as far as like illustrative, as far as we know, right? This is, again, an opaque regime, but examples of how this played out in practice? Yeah, absolutely. So again, we don't know exactly what happened in those rooms during those decision-making times, but we have some sense from people. And we do have the idea that there was a lot of optimism within Putin's inner circle that the invasion would be successful and relatively quick. I think they sincerely believed it. And one of the reasons they believed that is because they underestimated the level of popularity of Zelensky's regime. They thought everything that the Ukrainians believe is propaganda. And as soon as the Russian army comes in, the entire edifice will collapse. This is a classic element of thinking in personal regimes, that when people believe something that I don't, it's because of some kind of false consciousness of propaganda. All I have to do is puncture that bubble and everything will collapse. Uh, all the traitors will run away and all the Ukrainian people will realize I need to embrace the Russian people. They are my brothers. I think there was a sincerely held element of that belief within Putin's inner circle. And that proved to be disastrously wrong very quickly. Uh, now, the real question is, how how much can they adapt? How much can Putin adapt? How much can his inner circle adapt? Uh, just because they have this set of perception that they started the war with, does that mean they're bound to be in this informational bubble? For me, the deeply troubling question is, are they actually able to get out of that informational bubble and, and learn what's happening and adjust the war conduct accordingly? So I think one of the things I wanted to ask you about and explore, I think just for the sake of being academically rigorous, and I don't mean to ask a tongue-in-cheek or devil's advocate question here, but we're assuming that Russia did make a mistake here. And the counterpoint would be that Russia is now uh, occupying about, what, 20% of Ukraine, I think just a bit under it. We're starting to see some fraying resolve in the West, I think maybe safe, some concerns about inflation and the ongoing costs of prosecuting the war, certainly here in the States. Um, if we're arguing that, did did Russia actually make a mistake? Why might we make that point? Yeah, so it's a great question. And I think we do have to be careful to uh, assign uh, motives to leaders that we don't know anything about what, what's really going on in their head. Uh, Isa Ding, who's a scholar of modern autocracy, she recently observed that a lot of how we study autocracies has in it what we call, uh, what she called autocratic teleology, this idea that everything rulers do is to stay in power. And, and she points out that that's a problem because quite often rulers don't seem to behave with that in mind. And Putin's actions are possibly one example of that. So we have to be careful what we mean by mistake. If we think everything Putin does is calculated to stay in power, was the invasion a mistake? I would still say probably yes. Uh, there were no significant threats to Putin's hold on power before February 22. And we certainly wouldn't have seen anything like Prigozhin's weird mutiny, whatever you want to call that. On the other hand, in some ways, Putin's position is maybe even more consolidated. The oligarch's fortunes are you know, now tied even more to him in some ways. He's arrested opposition figures from the far right. So he doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And the country itself seems to be settled in for prolonged national mobilization. But at the same time, he's presiding over what to me looks like an increasingly unpredictable regime. I mean, again, like something like Prigozhin's mutiny or even uh, the events at the, at the airport a couple of weeks ago. So this regime is slowly approaching the end of its life. It's just inevitable biologically, and it appears vulnerable to certain pressures. Uh, again, Putin has relied on a sort of small circle of loyalists, and that creates a government structure that's pretty hard, that's pretty resistant to adaptation. And that's especially dangerous given all institutional deficiencies that Russia is facing, all the systemic corruption in which the regime operates. And so he still has the support of the coercive apparatus. He faces no immediate threats, as far as we can see. But I think overall regime uncertainty has increased. And if you're a leader of a person's regime, more uncertainty is the last thing you want. So you talked about that this is a slowly ending regime, not necessarily on a, a moral or a political level, but basic biology. Putin is not immortal. None of us are. Let's just assume 
well, not assume, he will die at some point, as everyone does. How do personalist regimes tend to end, in, at least in the theory? What, what does that lead to following them? Uh, so another problem for personalist regimes is they have a lot of problems with secession. Uh, how do you institutionalize secession when you have no formal institutions? How do you get to decide who follows the ultimate ruler? It's hard. And what you have a lot of times are struggles for power, uh, sort of court intrigues and palace coups. Those are the kinds of things we see a lot in personalist regimes. Will we see something like that? That's extremely hard to say. There's no named successor to Putin. It's questionable whether he will formally name one. And if he did, it would be sort of a kind of a death sentence for that person, potentially. So it's not clear to me that there is a, a way in which this can be resolved institutionally. I love to point out that, you know, Russia as it conceives itself as the uh, the third Rome. And I find that irony or ironic in, in a certain sense that the Roman Empire very famously never figured out how to do uh, succession uh, just time and again leaders getting assassinated, palace coups here and there. So a parallel that maybe they uh, didn't think of when coming up with that national conception. But this is the, you know, this is, if, if personalist regimes ever figure out how to do secession properly, then they might pause it, create a real long-term threat. But this is something that uh, they have not figured out. And this is something that keeps undermining their countries. I mean, forget Putin. From Russia's perspective, of course, the war is a huge mistake. There's no doubt about it. The country is more isolated more shunned, more unpopular, more dependent on China, and just a complete waste of potential, like a huge shame. You know, as, as speaking as somebody who grew up there, who still, you know, until recently still felt some connection to it emotionally, you have resources, you have an educated population. It would not have taken that much for Russia to become a kind of a normal European leaning regional power, but that's not enough. It must have respect. It must have an empire. So you get this as a result, you know, хотелика лучше получилось как всегда. And personalism plays a role here. The fact that you have rulers that are concerned primarily with themselves and uh, with staying in power, you know, we can we can question how what other motivations drive Putin. But the fact that you know that's a major motivation creates all these uh, issues for the country. It's like a never-ending cycle that I hope I get to see end sometime during my lifetime two comments for for listeners here so that that russian quote translates to uh we wanted the best and it turned out like always which i think is a uh, fixed a popular popular phrase what was it uh Cherna Mirden, right in, mm-hmm. the, in the nine days is the kind of classic emblematic quote the yogi Berra of the ni- 1990s russia yes we... a lot of very very memorable lines and then Part two, for some of this national conception, there has to be an empire. The interview I did with Jane McGlynn uh, back earlier this year is great uh, further listening if that's up your alley. Another question for you. You wrote, and I was doing some uh, scholarly output stalking before this episode, I believe in 2018, about how the West uh, studies Russia and how the West understands Russian foreign policy, which is funny. My first big translation in, in this field was of a piece in Commerçant from Russians about how the West studies Russia. So a very interesting look at a level more meta, right? It's not what is Russia doing, but how do we even conceive of, of what Russia is doing? So what does the West, or let's actually break this into two parts. What did the West get wrong or has the West gotten wrong about Russia and Russian foreign policy? Has that changed in your view as time has progressed? Yeah, so that's a piece I wrote uh, with Andrei Tsikankov, uh, we wrote it probably five or six years now ago, who's a very prolific scholar of Russian foreign policy. And uh, what we argue in that piece is it's a mistake to judge Russian foreign policy purely by its domestic autocratic nature. Uh, and the, there's this idea in American foreign policy, what we call the Wilsonian bias, that democracies always act a particular way because they're democratic, and that autocracies are sort of destined to act in a particular way because they're autocratic. And what we were trying to point out is that Putin's regime has not acted in that way, that it's been fairly adaptable, even pragmatic when necessary. So we should not expect the same policies every time from Russia. And we should not be surprised when Putin's policies change in unexpected ways. What we did not anticipate in writing that piece is that his policies would change in a way that would seem to actively undermine Russian national interests. 
uh, for all the reasons I already talked about. So looking back, I think our mistake, and Andres and, and myself, was to see Putin as too constrained by his geopolitics, as too pragmatic. Uh, that's not to say that he's irrational. I think it's a mistake to sort of automatically dismiss his behavior as purely irrational. But it's to say that the cost-benefit ca- calculation that he's making, uh, it's not one that we in the West uh, can easily understand. And perhaps there are other keys into uh, his behavior that we need to adapt, uh, like the frame of uh, imperialism, for example, and how that figures into it, or even personal grievances, things that are hard to theorize, but things that may shed light on the complicated ways in which uh, Russian foreign policy has spooled out in the past 10 or 20 years. I think that takes us to the end of our questions for today. Seva, thank you for joining. Thank you. It's a pleasure and thank you for having me. Thanks again to Seva and to you, listener, for joining. So what do you think about what you heard? I'm really hoping to do more of these theory applied episodes next season. Wink, wink. Be sure to follow the Bear Market Brief at the Twitter handle, or I guess X handle, at Bear Market Brief. The Bear Market Brief is a project of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a nonpartisan think tank based here in sunny Philadelphia. For more information on this initiative and on many others, visit fpri.org. Have a great holiday season, and we'll catch you next year.